My name is Bob Gould. I am in the Department of Radiology at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm a medical physicist. And this is a talk on software approaches for CT dose reduction. Well, CT was the first fully digital imaging device in radiology. It, it differs from projection imaging in that the X-ray source and detectors move during data acquisition. So you never actually look at any of the projection data. It requires a computer reconstructed image to give you a cross-section. So it was a cross-sectional device. Ultrasound was introduced before then, which was also cross-sectional. But it was fully digital and requires a reconstructed. So that's very important. The software is inherent to the formation of an image. So the digital image, which we know we never view, the eye is an analog device. We always convert our digital image, which is really an array of discrete elements, numbers, used to represent the image in a digital format. So each of these elements is given a number, pixel value we call it. Uh, it really represents uh, a voxel volume element, a fully three-dimensional, but when we view it, we only view the edge of it, and that's called a pixel, picture, picture element. And normally in CT, the format is square, and 512 by 512. So the task of the CT reconstruction is to assign each voxel in the matrix a value that is linearly related to the attenuation coefficient of the material represented by the voxel. So that is to come up with a pixel value for each of the elements in our matrix. The problem is that there is CT noise. So there is always a level of uncertainty in the CT number that we assign or that the reconstruction assigns to a particular pixel. We can quantify that uncertainty as the standard deviation of, of the pixel values within a uniform object. And the reason for the uncertainty is simply photon statistics or uh, usually uh, is the dominant factor at least. To some extent, artifacts as well, if they were streaking or other uh, hardening artifacts due to the characteristics of the X-ray beam uh, can cause uncertainty in the, in the CT numbers. And lastly, electronic and detector noise can contribute. So for example, uh, characterization, characterization of CT noise, if this is, say it's a water bath that we're imaging, if we looked at the, uh, the center of this phantom, what we would expect is all of the CT numbers to be represented by zero, which is by definition the CT number of water. But in fact, we see that we get a, a distribution and the standard deviation of that distribution can be used to characterize noise. So why does noise hurt us? Well, noise hurts us because it decreases our ability to see subtle differences in attenuation. So if you look at the image on the left, a noise-free image where the signal is uh, a small object, say, within a, another object and two different attenuation values, the signal is simply the difference in those attenuation values. But when you add noise to the picture, it can be very difficult to distinguish that difference. And in fact, the greater the noise, the greater the signal has to be in order to observe it. How can we decrease noise? Well, we can increase the MAS. That affects patient dose. We increase it, it increases patient dose. We can increase the KVP, leaving the MAS the same. That also increases patient dose. Uh, and it also has a consequence of reducing the contrast. 
we can increase the pixel size, all other factors being equal. And that has the effect of reducing spatial resolution. We can change the slice thickness. That also uh, increases uh, or decreases spatial resolution. And lastly, we can play with the reconstruction. So maybe there is a way within the reconstruction to decrease noise. And in particular, for filtered back projection, which we'll talk about, we could change the reconstruction kernel. So the image reconstruction is the mathematical process by which the X-ray transmission measurements form the two-dimensional cross-section that we look at. So it assigns an integer number to each voxel in the matrix that's related to the attenuation coefficient. What we have to work with are, are rays, projections, the data sample obtained by a single detector at a particular angle. And it produces a single measurement, which we'll call a sample, of X-ray attenuation along a path between the source and the detector. So we have a, the rays are going to be used then as part of the reconstruction to, to create the reconstruction. So let's consider first a simple reconstruction where there's no movement of the object. So we start the source at zero degrees. It rotates around to 180 degrees. The beam then bath, passes exactly along the path, but in an opposite direction. And what you'll see is, or if you think about it, since the object is not moved and is the same, the 0, 180, and 180, 0 rays are exactly the same. So in fact, to do a reconstruction, we really only have to go 180 degrees around the patient. The EMI head scanner did this, very first scanner. If we only did that, it would produce a dose distribution which is non-uniform. One side of the head would be, or object would be irradiated to a greater extent than the other. The way that machines do uh, the reconstruction is what's called filtered back projection. So it's a convolution that involves multiplication of two functions, a filter function, which we call the kernel, and the actual view data itself, that is the, the actual ray data that was collected by the machine. So the filter function is used to correct for blurring, which simple back projection introduces. And the kernel is a variable. That is, we can leave some of the blur in, meaning uh, lose spatial resolution, but reduce noise. So here's an example of filtered back projection. If you look at the, the data that was collected uh, on the left, and then you back project it, you don't back project it. Uh, you take those projections, you multiply by the kernel that creates this overshoot to eliminate streaks, but it's very fast and, and easy to do. Well, then along came helical imaging around 1990, where the tube was uh, continuously moving, the detectors were continuously moving, while the table was translated through. So that means that the 0 and 180 are no longer identical because the object moved. It means there is no predetermined slice plane, that the slice centering is completely ar arbitrary, and the reconstruction interval between them is also arbitrary. So the reconstruction had to change. So we call this the pitch, which has to do with spiral or helical acquisition. And it's defined as the table travel divided by the, the z-axis beam thickness, nt. So if the pitch is greater than 1, we actually reduce patient dose. If the pitch is less than 1, then patient dose is increased relative to conventional axial imaging. So here is a, a situation where the software was modified to account for a helical acquisition, and it can be dose savings by using a pitch of greater than one. 
The next uh, important development was multi-detector row CT. So in this case, along the z-axis, we have a whole series of detectors rather than just a single detector. It facilitates the helical acquisition because it can move the table extremely fast. You still use filtered back projection, but you can use cone beam reconstructions uh, to do the reconstruction. So what do multi-detector row CT do? Well, it facilitates the acquisition of thin slices over large volumes. So thin slices reduce partial volume effects, improve spatial resolution, and are potentially more diagnostic, but the fine print is that to get these thinner slices of equal quality, it requires a higher dose. So the patient dose will go up if all that is done is thinner slices are acquired by these multi-detector row CTs. So how have the CT developments gone up, at least the ones we've talked about so far? They've gone up because of increased utilization of CT and greater use of thinner slices. Now filtered back projection uh, does have some drawbacks. One is it's very sensitive to artifacts. Abrupt changes, inconsistencies in the transmission data from sample to sample or view to view, and these abrupt changes tend to cause streaks in the image. So filtered back projection, as I said, is the method used on all commercial CT scanners. It is very fast. It uh, does allow noise reduction, but you have to trade off spatial resolution to achieve that. And it's sensitive to noise and artifacts. So there is no statistical corrections in the samples that are obtained. It assumes simple ray geometry. So within the fat last five to six years, there's a, a, an alternative reconstruction method called iterative reconstruction. Turns out that it's a, to some degree a reinvention because in fact it was used by the EMI head scanner and then everybody went over to filtered back projection. But it uses uh, uh, an estimate of the image to obtain calculated projections which are then compared to the actual sampled values. So you initially do what's called a forward projection likely on the filtered back projection image that you've reconstructed. So by forward projecting, you uh, obtain calculated projections. You compare these then to the samples that you collected. So you iterate, you adjust uh, the, the sample values based on the difference between the calculated projections and the measured projections. So the iterations can be limited to a fixed number or allowed to continue until the calculated projections and sampled values converge. So here, here's the reconstructed image. Here's an example of, of what we're doing here. We're comparing our forward projected data to the measured projected data. And the, because uh, a filtered back projection image, for example, there are going to be differences between these. And what you're trying to do is minimize those differences between the forward projected and the measured data. So you apply constraints in doing this, you know, statistical weights, you reconstruct a new image, adjusting the estimates of attenuation values in the image. Then you do the forward projection again and compare those to the measured projection data. So here's the implementation, the steps. You forward project through uh, estimated object to obtain the stimulated, simulated projection values. You compare, you adjust the attenuation values, uh, reconstructing a new image, and then you do the forward projection again. And maybe you do this a finite number of times, or you do it um, until that difference is minimized to a certain extent. 
So the challenge here, though, is it's con computationally intensive. It's slower than filtered back projection, but it uh, does allow you to reduce noise for a given dose without a loss in spatial resolution. So that's very important point there. So you're reducing noise, but without having to trade off in spatial resolution. And it can uh, alter the noise appearance somewhat, but the standard deviation of the noise can be kept the same as for a filtered back projection image with a reduction of 20 to 40 percent uh, in the, the actual dose that's used. So you reduce the dose to the patient by, let's say, 40 percent, do the iterative reconstruction, and you come up with an image that's equivalent to a filtered back projection obtained at 40 percent higher dose. Uh, and this may be higher in larger patients. So the iterative reconstruction is now available from all the manufacturers. Uh, it does provide statistical modeling for the ray samples. In other words, it helps correct for statistical noise. The future implementations will account for system optics. In other words, be more sophisticated in their what they can achieve in the iterations. This is called model-based iterative reconstruction. It has the uh, potential to lower noise and reduce uh, uh, and improve spatial resolution. So that's extremely powerful. Lower noise, improves spatial resolution. And the noise reductions are really quite remarkable. However, the reconstruction times, because it's so uh, computer intense, can be greater than an hour. And it also allows for sparse data reconstruction. It means you have to take fewer projections. So really, it's going from modeling and filtered back projection, where you assume the source, the object, meaning the voxel and the detector, are all a point to where you have a realistic system with a focal spot that has a finite area, a voxel that has a realistic volume, and the net result is a response function within the detector system itself. And all of these can be corrected for or modeled in uh, an iterative sense. And uh, this has been implemented by one manufacturer at this point, uh, GE, and the data sets that they produce are, are really quite remarkable of what the, the difference can be between filtered back projection and the, the iterative model-based reconstruction. So more efficient use of detected x-rays, no change in the acquisition hardware is required. So this is uh, a remarkable aspect is that I'm not improving the efficiency of the detectors, I'm not um, creating better collimators or some other methodology to reduce dose. I'm really doing this strictly in the reconstruction. It's less sensitive to artifacts and potential to reduce noise and improve spatial resolution. Really remarkable. Iterative techniques are significant in reducing CT doses, but further development is uh, occurring. Everyone is investing in this and and uh, that is all the vendors are. We can expect the times for these MBIR reconstructions to be reduced uh, and actually uh, improve spatial resolution at some point and possibly uh, allow for fewer projections to still give you a comparable image. Thank you.